setting up the numbers for those of you who did not find out how to do this, this is how you do it. Based on one, one, one count, one, two, three count, one, three, seven count. You begin with the number that played that day, counting with the first segment, just adding one number each time you move down brings you back to the same number. Here, you add one to the first column, two numbers to the second column, three numbers to the third that brings you back to the number you start with. Here, you add one number to the first column, three numbers to the second column, seven to the third column that brings you back to the number you start with. It's that simple. And you divide or square the column off by counting down one, two, three. Start to square it and count down one, two, three and square it off. That gives you the center of the nine manifested numbers on each chart. Much of the time, 40, 50 percent, the number that is going to play for that day will appear at the top or the bottom of the square based upon your lead number. And that, that's the way you set it up. That's a first part of it. Here, you recall, you find the, this group of numbers, which is an accumulation of numbers, by taking the middle number from that number, whatever it is, and adding the three numbers from the left column. Add this number to that. That's 49. That's 40. That's 41. That's how you get these three numbers. This one comes from the second and third number. 5 and 6, 56. Once you place these four numbers at the bottom, you simply count backwards three times to get the accumulation of each number. 49, 38, 27, 60. 4, 3, 2, 1, 9, 8, 7, 6. You do that with all four columns. It presents a picture of the accumulation of numbers in terms of quantity. Then you select all of the numbers chronologically out of this and line them up on the side from one to zero. Can you see that one column there? Okay. There are four ones. When you see a group of numbers that have brought out five, this becomes your major key for selecting a lead number, which is referred to as the vibration of change. Five is the vibration of change. It often shows you what is going to repeat the next day from, uh, particularly from the, the three numbers that plate. About four to five times out of the week in almost every state, one of the numbers that played the previous day comes back, okay? Except, as a minor rule, except that does not prove true after a double does not prove true after double. Most of the time, all of the numbers change after double. Not all the time, most of the time. Whenever a double is shown, like Friday, I think, was 997. And you see two numbers of the same together. The tendency is for one of those digits to come back the next day. If they are split, they tend to lose power and don't come back. Usually none of the numbers come back. Sometimes the middle number, whatever it is, will come back. And with the nine, which is the power number, you can measure and weigh that in terms of searching for uh, your lead number with that particular number, with nine. In upstate New York, in the Eastern Territory, eight has been the big performer. It has magnificent power of return. Sometimes it will play five times in a row. Yeah. I mean, it, there are time periods when uh, the eight shows up. You, you can grab a, a group of numbers with an eight in it and just win because you got numbers with eight in it. That's been that remarkable uh, in the eastern part of the country. I don't look at Texas and uh, California and so forth, uh, Western territories. My concentration is essentially an eastern territory where the land mass is interconnected, where the land mass is interconnected because of planetary position. And but I don't want to get into that. But that's what I've been looking at. I've been essentially looking at the New York number and occasionally looking at the Florida number. Okay. 
Okay, with the couple of You break your, your number down into the three segments it has as parts. And 350, which played uh, Tuesday, 350305. Quite often, a couplet, two of the numbers from a given number, will come back the next day. I, I have an example. I don't want to go through my notebook, but I just put this up. But I have several examples from last month and this month where that occurred, where two of the numbers came back several times. And it certainly makes it easy for finding the hit of that date. And so you want to keep that little rule in mind. Then you separate all three of the numbers and look at them according to this scale, which will be illustrated here. And according to your tic-tac-toe, we'll just use this particular number as an example. <coughs> how is it up there? 840. That's how you set up your tic-tac-toe uh, to calculate with the same number. This is the second part of the workout. This is the upside. This is the downside. I'll add a little bit more to that in just a second. Upside, meaning the numbers are going chronologically up beginning with whatever number is here on the right-hand square, which happens to be a zero. So the next number would be one, two, three, four, five, six. You fill in all of the squares. The numbers left over, you write them under the tic-tac-toe, which would be seven and nine. Here, you go in reverse. This is the downside, which would be nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. The numbers missing here would be one, two, and three. Two factors have verified themselves over the couple of years I've been looking at these extra numbers, so-called. A, the number often appears on the total top line. Uh, it did with five, uh, it came 652, 625. It was all on top. Uh, I think that was two, with two also 634. But you look at the total top numbers, and if you want, write them out so that you get sets of numbers from the accumulated numbers here. For instance, 832, 870, uh, 878, 328, two, uh, 287, uh, 837. Those would be the three numbers on top. And just write them off to the side to look at. Then you look to see what numbers here are on the top line. That's another key of what is possibly going to play. The one in the uh, two and the three are on the top line, and also the seven, which would give you 327, which incidentally did play, but it didn't play behind this number recently. But we're talking about looking for the number of that day, not just for the whole week. That's a matter of preference as to whether you take one number and play it Monday to Saturday or Monday to Sunday uh, in terms of uh, what could be called the illegal lottery uh, here in the state of Georgia right now and playing in New York or Illinois numbers. Or you look at the numbers again in couplets, 79s, 71, 91s, 27, 37, and place those up top in couplets. Often a pair of these numbers will play, and you take them back to your workout as a couplet to find the position they are in the chart. By moving one number up or down, let's say we take 27 as a couplet, as composed from here, and we look for 27. By moving the 2 up, you would see 2, 7, 3. By moving uh, the 7 down, you would see 274. That's how you would compose the number. Okay. You do that with each one of the squares and starting at the top of the square working to the bottom of the square with each number if it has or is one of your lead numbers or the couplet itself. Okay. Oh, uh, the downside upside is in reference to the stock market. When the stock market falls, that's down. You then look at your downside 
in searching, searching for the number. When the stock market is up, you will go to your upside in searching for the number. I don't have a copy of the uh, USA Today, but the numbers you're interested in looking at in the stock market, will, uh, if you see it on television, it'll say Dow, then it'll say uh, up 2.91, for instance. Okay. You're looking at these three numbers. Now what often occurs, two things. One of these numbers will play. On various occasions, the whole stock market will fall in that state, whatever the state might be. And that, that's been seen too many times in, in Ohio. Quite often, the last number is a number of concern. When you get to, for, for instance, finding the column, one of these numbers will be the column that the number will come out of. It's happened too many times for me to ignore. So let's say it's the one column. I would go here to the one column. And if my hunch is, 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 is correct and I'm verifying particularly a lead number, I would then take that lead number, let's say it's a two, I take out all the numbers with a two in it. That would be one, two, three, four numbers. I'd play all four of those numbers, straight and fast. Or, if I just want to play the column, I'd play all 12 of the numbers, which would cost six dollars fifty cents each and twelve dollars per phone numbers based on what kind of percentage they're playing in the state of Georgia, which we don't know yet. So that's one way you use these columns to play. And it works, okay? The other fact, again, as I showed you with the uh, tic-tac-toe, like this, Well, the column in this particular section here, the ninth, eighth column, ninth column, zero column, one of these columns tends, numbers rather, tends to be the column that will play that date. That often happens too often again to ignore. Okay, I've got some other information. I'll go, go on now to our spiritual work here. Uh, the only comment I have about the previous lecture is just simply one. The law of unity states, was stated by Jesus in the Bible, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That's a law of the universe. If Malcolm was the devil, the devil don't kill the devil. If the white boy is the devil, then Malcolm has to be God. If Malcolm is the devil, then the white boy has to be God. That's all I have to say about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the law, how it works. You know, we, we got few enough heroes, we don't need to knock them off <clears throat> the little pedestals that we have them on. We're still too ambivalent about ourselves and each other to mar the image of those that have given their lives for us. And if he was the devil, shit, then we ought to be glad the devil came down and helped. <laughs> we we shouldn't have need some help. Well, let me leave that alone because I'll get off into another thing. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about the uh, sixth chakra and a part that's in between the sixth and the seventh chakra. For those who are here for the first time, let me mention where we are in our viewing and discussion. We're talking about spiritual faculties, not the self. The whole lecture series has not been about you, the soul, but about your vehicles, plural, your spiritual bodies and their faculties, and how the power that comes from the soul works through those faculties. We've talked about the 12 glands that are physical organisms in your body, that have a correspondent organism in your astral body, your invisible body that Paul mentions. If there's a physical body, there must be a spiritual body. He offers that as the law of duality, which is correct. We're talking about the causal body, the body inside the astral body that has the faculties of chakra, 
which means turning wheel, that emanates power. The wheel within a wheel uh, of Ezekiel is in reference to those chakras. We'll get to that when we get to the 12 signs of the zodiac. Okay, the faculty we're going to deal with is referred to as Ajna in the Sanskrit language. I don't know what it is in the Kemetic language. I don't want to get into too many languages until we understand what we're talking about. Then we can have the luxury of making this antiquity of comparison in terms of language. Uh, it tends to distract us. We're not talking about the word. We're talking about the faculty. We're not really talking about the faculty. We're really talking about power. That's our major concern. And essentially, the work is not to, have, to find out how much you know about the faculty, but how much power you can get through that faculty to go to work for you now. That, that's the goal. Okay, it doesn't matter if you don't have, understand the whole business of chakras and, and uh, glands. Can you raise your consciousness so this power can work through you to perfect your life and grant you the success that you're supposed to have because you are who you are? that you were born to succeed. Failure is a misunderstanding of your own nature. It has nothing to do with God's punishment, with as to whether the white boy likes you or don't like you. It has nothing to do with that. If you are powerless, a mouse can take you off. But if you're powerful, another God can do a thing to you. That that's your natural status. That's what we need to know. We don't need to get into the problem of comparative dualities. What's better than this? What's worse than that? That, that doesn't gain power. Our major key in the acquiescence, the bidding of power, is divine love. I, I don't want to see any of you with God's power and no love in your heart. It, it makes you a monster. That's the difference between the good Lord and the damn devil. And he's got power too, but he don't love nobody. <laughs> no, I ain't for that. Okay. This is a picture. I, I, let me. I'll show this, but I, I don't want to. Reason I haven't been doing this because I don't want to get us psychologically caught up in this gorgeous art art form that this particular author presents in his uh, book, okay, because your chakra doesn't look like that, okay, it's just beautiful, I mean, you know, it's nice to look at, but again, we don't want to get distracted from our spiritual reality, which is what reality is, spiritual. Uh, the other one is Soma, the one just above that faculty, in the front of the brain, okay, the penile gland, as you well know, is centered midway in the brain, near the limbic area of the brain. The ventricular area is referred to in physiological anatomy. We are talking about this area here for Ajna. The difference between the chakra Ajna and that of the penile gland is that it covers this entire area which includes divine will, understanding, which would mean then power. This is a very important faculty to get open because with it, whatever you so will into existence comes into existence. If you want to expand your reality, you have to demonstrate your ability. That's why I'm saying we're not interested in the intellectual accomplishments in, in, in this lecture series. We're interested in your spiritual accomplishments. That you go home and change something in your world from within out. Okay. As some folks have been doing already. But, but you have to meditate. You have to practice. And, and be willing, most importantly, for black folks, you must be willing to become God. And that ain't easy. The will, to quote a white boy, uh, which is all right, Nietzsche.
Nietzsche said, it is the will to power. That's universal. That belongs to the white boy. It belongs to the universe. That's how you get power. By your will. Some folks, many folks, they just want to get by. I want to start, I just don't want, want no trouble. I, I just want everything to, you know, well, that's fine. But, but you're not going to be able to do much with that kind of pacifist attitude. If you want to talk real revolutionary, this is revolution. <laughs> you know, especially when you come up with some dynamite power to demonstrate and to do what you are designed to do. Okay, I'm going to do some reading here uh, to give you some facts from those that have authored this information. chakra or the command chakra. That's not quite true. The penile gland is the one that has been depicted as Ein Sof, the eye of wisdom in, in the Hebrew context. Ein Sufis in the ancient Kemetic language, the wisdom eye, the wise eye, is the concept that is brought forward to this third eye conceptualization of human ability. Note I say human ability. In other words, as a human being, you're supposed to have access to your penal gland. As a god, you're to have access to an all-seeing eye. An eye that does not shut down. <laughs> as the penal gland is usable now and then, and sometimes you don't see anything, and sometimes you do. In, with the gland or faculty or facility of the chakra, you will have an ability to see whatever you want to see, whenever you want to see it. That's how powerful this particular faculty it, it is. So it is actually above and inclusive of the so-called third eye because it uses the nerve center in the activation of that chakra. Okay. Uh, well, let me leave that alone. It's a lot of juicy information. I don't want to get into that. Purpose and function of the sixth chakra. Conscious perception of being takes place through the sixth chakra. It is the seat of our higher mental powers our intellectual capacity to distinguish our memory and our will. On the physical plane, it is the highest center of command for the central nervous system. Its actual color is a clear indigo blue, but yellow and violet shades are also found therein. There is no particular emanation of energy that represents any of the faculties. That emanation and its complexion is simply the representation of where you have developed in your particular spiritual path. There isn't any particular one. The goal is to get beyond the eight colors and get to this point where you see all of them at once in their rainbow effect. And then you get into this level where everything is perfectly clear. And then you even go beyond that, where, where there's a light behind the light. It's so bright, if your spiritual eye isn't developed, you, you can't even look at it with your spiritual eye. Okay. Rational or intellectual thought may produce yellow radiation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, extrasensory perception is shown in shades of violet. In other words, extrasensory perception or extrasensory ability, which is your brain, <laughs> that's your extrasensory or sensors. These are faculties in your brain, in your spiritual brain, or astral brain, and your causal brain. That, that's all we're talking about, is, is bodies. 
Okay? We haven't even touched on, on the soul ability, sitcom, the powers of the soul. So we get a picture of how far behind we are in our clock of destiny, which we will look at in the 12 signs of the zodiac. If a human being is held back physically as a point of slavery, he is also held back or retarded spiritually because his mental capacity is limited being a part of his physical capacity. But the click and tick and roll of time goes on. In the metaphysical school, they're telling black folks that everything is in harmony. Everything is in tune. No, it's not. Now, we are late, folks. You know, We are late. In 1993, we got seven years to go before the astronomical as well as astrological time clock of the year 2000 happens. You know? And we ain't raised up to G.O.D. yet. But there is supposedly a quantum leap to happen between now and then for those who are tuning in. We're not going to be able to do it by ourselves. The universe is going to help us. For those who can withstand the power of the Spirit will get raised up. That those who can't will get knocked, brushed, swept off the great carpet down. So the thing is, is, get in tune and stay in tune. So something is coming. There's no doubt about that. I'm not going to try to get into predictions and all that. But we're, we're in a serious upward swing. And it, it ain't about even choosing sides. It's about getting on up there. You know, where you can be safe. You know? And then maybe you can turn around and save somebody else. But that, that's the real deal. Okay. The creative process starts when being rests in itself, becomes conscious of, it, of its existence. An initial relationship between subject and object takes place, thus giving rise to duality. Being in its shapelessness manifests a first pattern of vibration. On the basis of this first primordial vibration, each step forward into the development of awareness creates a new and different pattern of vibration. <coughs> That's kind of riding the, the concept of duality. What we are trying to do in spiritualization, in chanting, in meditation, in hearing a higher vibratory sound is to raise our own inner vibration to change patterns of rhythm. That's what you're trying to do. That's what you're doing in meditation, in chanting, and in using the techniques. The more you can raise your level of vibration, the higher you're going to be moving in energy or and in spirit and then in consciousness. It's the difference between standing in a hole trying to see what the sun looks like in the northeast and standing on the ground seeing what the sun looks like in northeast. <coughs> Levels of awareness. The higher you're vibrating, the more you're going to be aware of. The more your consciousness will expand. A kind of abstract idea, but very real. Somewhat similar to peripheral vision as I stand here there's a certain object off to my right I can see, partially. The more I tune into peripheral viewing, the more to my extreme right I can see. That's increasing in awareness. Except in consciousness we're talking about up here, where we can see more of what's out there as well as what is behind it. That's spiritual seeing. So that you can form know in advance of what's coming down the street before it comes down the street. That's foreknowledge. You are supposed to have such abilities. On the basis of this first primordial vibration, each step forward in the development of awareness creates a new and different pattern of vibration. Thus, all levels of creation are contained in human life Read that again. 
all levels of creation are contained in human life. From pure ethereal being to the denses of matter and in turn are represented in the chakra with their various levels of vibration. Thus the process of manifestation also takes place within and through us. I think I'll be repeating myself, what we're talking about are different levels of vibration, different levels of energy, which makes for different heavens, different planes of paradise, different worlds of experience. The only difference between this plane and the next, which is the fourth dimension, is a matter of vibration. This is heavier, denser than the fourth dimension. But there are places just like this on the fourth plane where people are walking around, sitting around, going to lectures, going to dances, going, going to church. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just like going to sleep and waking up one day in somebody else's house. Where am I? And then you suddenly see somebody that you know. And you forget you were down here. That's what dead is. That's all. Losing the awareness of the present condition and becoming aware of another condition. That, that, that's what death is. If you have no uh, spiritual awareness, you can go to a level where there is nothing on it but dark, where you can't see anything. Though there may be other souls down. Uh, uh, one young girl had that experience with her father who came back and told her, don't come down there where he was. There's nothing down there but dark. And he was a pimp who mistreated everybody in his work, including the girl's mother, but the girl loved him. So uh, evidently she was, you know, he was given the privilege of coming back to forewarn her about her behavior. We go to the level, the next level of what we are aware of. Well, the spiritual personality that meditates and remains conscious of the idea of God he or she goes to a plane where God is functioning on. If you recall the quote that Dr. King stated when he got shot, he said, oh God. So we know he went up there on that simple amount of information. That that's what he was aware of at the point that he was part of the body. The spiritual master simply sits down, lays down, or gets in a spiritual position and brings his tension, attention to Ajna and contemplates Ajna and he goes to the plane that he sees consciously leaving the body. Hazarani Inayat Khan, the Sufi master, a black man, laid down, took two deep breaths and died. That's how he left the body. The spiritual master does not go through the gates he leaves by the back of heaven. Sasumna. That little hole in the top of your head, we're going to get to that. A very meaningful spiritual faculty worthy of your effort to get open. I think one safe way to say that it is opening is when you see a spinning or turning in your third eye area then you're seeing the activity of a chakra. But don't frown down at the power indication of spiritual energy in those areas. That means you have, when you see purple in your consciousness, that means you have power. That's the complexion of purple, the vibration of the center. Whatever vibratory energy you see, you have that energy. It isn't just lights happening through you. Those are energies or spiritual consciousness coming from you. It is important to make the assessment that you already have power, that you're already God. The psychological assumption is necessary in spiritual growth and development. Humility is not denial of your greatness, of your divinity, of your perfection. The, the real definitive of a humble man is a man who is all powerful and he tiptoes on the earth in fear of causing it to explode. 
Mm -hmm. he, he can yeah. afford to be generous to a lesser being because the being can't harm him. And, and plus, those who are truly spiritual, they love. And, and love makes a right behavior towards all people. There's another picture of Soma that I found quite interesting I'd like for you to see. This upper part here. The, the, the one that's referred to as Soma is a part, I'm not pointing to it yet, is a part of Sahasara, the, the crown chakra. So uh, what I'm saying is that you may see several or multiple levels of energy at once. You know, because these are, this chakra is interconnected with the crown chakra. They are not one and apart. You know, we're still talking about the same body within ourselves. We're just simply talking about becoming aware of certain regions or areas where the power works through us. Now what we're doing is finding these chakras in uh, the book of Revelation, which essentially is about your spiritual nature, your spiritual power, and your godhood under the old species of your Christhood. It is primarily it is secondarily about the world outside of yourself, as we understand the law of correspondence. So where we are in this <clears throat> reading and tracing of uh, the seven seals as the seven chakras is uh, chapter 2, Revelations 2, verse 12, the message to Pergamum. Pergamum, in the metaphysical definition, means intelligence. I didn't bring my uh, metaphysical dictionary and it looks like the sister sold all of hers. So when you get home you can look this up if you want. If you have uh, the metaphysical dictionary. If you're going to be a student of the scriptures from a spiritual point of view, that, that's a very helpful book. Uh, I'll read it that is isn't it? It's, it's cost about 15 bucks. But it, it's worth it. Uh, because there's so few books that offer insight to the symbology of the scriptures on a higher level. Uh, there's another one I've been trying to get the, the brother to get a hold of, which may be out of print. Gas G. A. Gaskell's uh, Dictionary of Philosophy and Religion. Now, he deals with more of the uh, occult concepts of scriptures in, in a deeper way. Charles Fillmore stayed pretty much in term in, in, into defining, describing the glandular system he didn't really touch that much on the uh, chakra system in, in, in his writings. In most of his ministry, he don't even deal with it. But he, he does make brief commentaries on it. Okay. Anybody want to read uh, verses, verse 12 and verse 13? Anybody got that? I'm just checking to see how many of you American Moors brought the Bible. There's one there. Out loud, my sister, put your pop down. <laughs> you know, you're going to have a sugar attack, but that's all right. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> and to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right. These Pergamum. Okay. These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Okay. Uh, remember, this is a symbolic book. Okay. So, so we're not talking about Satan and, and Boogeyman out there. But we're talking about the concept that the word Satan represents. The sense mind. The flesh mind. The carnal mind. The carnal intellect. The word pergamum means intelligence. The throne of Satan is the conscious mind, okay, where all of our appetites begin. Where's my poem? Well, oh, I got it over here. Well, I would do that real neatly, and this would stay up there. <coughs> is the 
the seat of Satan, your conscious mind, your conscious will, your will to eat everything at McDonald's, <laughs> your will to drink everything in the drugstore. We, we drink 50, just a, a side issue here, the American Negro drinks 55% of all the scotch in America. Yeah, that sounds a bit satanic to me. <laughs> but in metaphysical terminology, we're talking about the carnal mind, the mind faculties that are attached to the body, to the glandular nature that has us serving this body instead of this body serving us. Okay? That, that, that in itself is demonic. That in itself will take you on out of here with no fringe benefits for above. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're talking about this area here, that the Christ mind is going to come back and claim okay. your Christ. Not somebody out there in the heavens, the one in you is going to come back and claim the people, the brethren, the faculty, the throne, the place, all symbological concepts of your own spiritual nature. That your Godhood is coming within you to claim its rightful place, the earth, the physical body. That, that, that's what spirituality is all about. That's the language of theology that is talking about an outside Christ. And there is one out there. In fact, there's several of them. But, but the one that will do you the most good is the one you raise up. The one you resurrect. That's your Christ. Okay. The one who has the sharp two-edged sword. The spiritual power of the word is what is represented by the concept of two-edged sword. As we looked at this word before. symbol here in symbology, making a dramatic one, represents power. In Islam there is a uh, quoting of <coughs> the uh, Kalima, la ilaha illallah, and underneath it or above it is a sword, words of power. It's a spiritual formula. That's the two-edged sword. However, there is a spiritual two-edged two sword that comes out of your mouth, Christ, when you get there. It's spiritually real, but it allows you the power of your own spoken word. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast. My name. What does name mean? Where's the sister that asked me before about her new name? She's not here. It's nature. 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 All right. Okay. Every time you see the concept in the scriptures of name, it means nature. If you understand the meaning of the concept Christ, you know he's talking about divine nature. He's talking about God. He's talking about the perfect mind that you are to put on that has power that knows no mistakes, no sickness, no death, no fear, no poverty, no disease. That's the nature of the Christ mind. And did not deny my faith. What does faith mean? Phodius means what? I never did give you all that little uh, exam, I promise. I'll drop it on you one day. <laughs> That's the Latin word for faith. And I don't want you to forget this. This is very important. All right. Very good. Very important. This is what is missing in the black personality. His confidence in himself, in herself. You know black folks believe in God. And all of them think God is the greatest. And they think they are the worst. Mm -hmm. That ain't what faith is for. Faith is power. 
must function within us, in our consciousness, in our spiritual nature. Faith can change things because it is power. It can change things. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance, period. If you want to know what faith is, it's a spiritual substance that pours out of the mouth of God, the medulla oblongata, a pure white light that's referred to as the blood of the Lamb that so fills you up you cannot deny that you are the Christ. <laughs> Overwhelms you. That whatever you say or think must be so, must be true. That's what you're trying to get open when you get open the medulla oblongata the mouth of God. My witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Who is the witness? Who is the faithful one? Your spiritual consciousness is the witness of your Godhood. Your level of awareness is what is killed as you engage in carnal living, in exterior living, in material living, you lose sight of things spiritual. Most children have spiritual dreams and visions. But if you tell, constantly tell your child, hush up, shut up, sit down, the child can't tell you what they just seen. <laughs> and I was in McDonald's one afternoon, and this young lady came in and set her daughter down. And she went to the counter to get something. And just as she went up there, I, come, I went back up to get me a, a, a refill on my coffee. And just as I started around her like this, her mother was coming back, which gave the impression as her mother was coming and I was going, the daughter said, Mama, somebody just touched me. And the woman turned around and looked at me. I said, what me? <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps a spirit did touch her. You know, but her mama's attention was all out here. You know, I guess I probably ended up there for rape or something if I hadn't been able to defend myself. <laughs> but we lose that as we become more earthbound, more involved in the materiality of the world. We lose our spiritual consciousness. It literally, spiritually, dies, closes down. So that we cannot use our faculties. Then, of course, we get engaged in reawakening. Wake up and finish the things that remain. That's what Christ is saying to all of us. Not to Christians, to Muslims, to Hebrews, to anybody who gains the knowledge of self. Jesus wasn't a Christian. Paul was a Christian. He came bringing power to whomever would come. Okay. I'm not trying to destroy all of Christendom now. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm trying to get us to penetrate the belief system, the theology that is in our way. It is limiting us in our ability to perceive who and what we are and where we are. A God and a good man are not the same thing. A good Christian and a Christ are not the same thing. We, we want to be able to know the difference, what we are striving for, what is made available for us by divine nature, it's herself. Put that. But I have a few things against you because you have there, some who hold the teachings of Balaam. Now this has shocked me a little bit. I had to wrestle with this concept because of, I'm really concerned about the European translator here. And uh, part of the problem, folks, is that only until Imam Isa did any black man deal with translating any scriptures. In America, no ma'am, no sir, on planet Earth, you know, that's part of the problem. All the Bibles you got, all the Qurans you have, are translated by Europeans. All of them. 
that they didn't invite one black man to any ecumenical council for the translation of any scriptures on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. No oriental of the Bible or of Quran. Very interesting. Okay, where, where was that? I just lost something there. But you didn't get this again. Was it? Oh, Bayland, yes. yes. Those are two Moorish names. Those are both bays. And of course, we know bay means king. We know Lam means third eye. Balaam was a prophet of Moab. Noble Draw Lee told the American Negroes in their reawakening that uh, we were Moabites. And uh, I, I had to deal with why he, he, he said that. I think one of the problems is because in Christianity, Egypt was cursed. And in the Bible, Egypt is the devil. And the Jew and the Hebrew are the children of God. That's all a Eurocentric point of view of the scriptures. Except when you get to the higher levels of study. Even Fillmore weaves a little honor in there for the concepts of Egypt and Ham and especially a very important concept, Amen, which is an African word, which means hidden God. But Balaam was a prophet. And of course in the metaphysical he's talking about a faculty in the brain that is prophetic. But understand the nature of the faculty in its various stages of development. I won't tell, say who his name is. He's a, he's a guy, he's, I don't think he's with us anymore, but he's got very sick. Uh, up at the coffee shop, donut shop, who had the ability to tell when any woman was available for the sheets. He could know that. You know, he would stand and ask himself. And he would go over to her and, and talk to her. I, he had an extraordinary ability to make that distinction. It, it was very much a prophetic ability. At his lowest yeah. level of performance, <laughs> I might add. <laughs> the problem of sorcery, which is selfishness, the problem of demolicism, of spiritism, of all of those negative concepts of the use of your spiritual faculties, to either control someone else, or to get something from people, or to get rich at the expense of others, or the ignorance or innocence of others. That is the false prophet. The, the same spiritual faculty in all of our brain working selfishly for that or through that individual. That's the false prophet. Virtually that's the satanic mind. So the idea of what we're doing is raising our consciousness to free our spiritual faculties from this bondage of limitation, from this selfishness, and from this dread or fear of poverty, the fear of death, the fear of the loss of one's love, all the fears, classically speaking, that promotes selfish behavior in human beings towards others. It would make an individual run into a store, stick a gun in his face and give me your money and then shoot him. And he can't, even, can't eat the damn money. He can't sleep on it. We're talking about getting our minds free. The Bible is talking about getting our minds free. Via power is how you get free. Via knowledge of self is how you get free. Let me look around make sure she's not here. I did a chart for a young woman a while back and while I'm just discussing these wonderful qualities that her name was showing, she kept trying to assert by confession that somehow she was evil, that she was negative. 
I, I don't know how she got bent out of shape like that. But I had to reassure her that there was nothing negative in her name or birthday. But because of lack of knowledge, people assume the lesser posture instead of the greater. Out of ignorance. That's where limitation comes from. That's where low performance comes from. That's where poverty comes from. If you make the assumption that you're doing it wrong, so be it. <laughs> According to your own will. Okay. Because you have this, because you have there some who hold the teachings of Balaam and kept teaching my people to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. A stumbling block, a psychological point of view of just what we talked about, that of cannot, fear, greed, and, and probably more than other, in any other, I think the, the, the real problem of uh, the lack of confidence is fear. The major key about understanding fear is that it is an illusionary force and it creates and perpetuates illusions. As long as you're mentally entertaining an illusion for you, the duration of that time, that illusion is real. Uh, quote, quote again, the, the example of my little one experience, uh, but I probably had others, I came back from watching the Frankenstein movies, got back about 10, 10, 30, it was dark, went in the, the building I stayed in, it's one of these real high ceilings, narrow hallways, and a, a 40 watt bulb to, to light the whole hallway, so I went zooming through the hall, I was about 10 or 11 years old, ran up the steps, the little panel missing in the front door, instead of trying to get the door open, knocked on the door, I jumped through the panel, ran in through the kitchen, jumped in the bed, pulled the cover over me, scared to death, get all the monsters in there with me. And I laid there, I don't know how long I laid there before the back of my mind, because that's where I heard it, I said, look out there, and I looked out. And there was this big, huge man standing there in an overcoat and hat. So I pulled the cover over and I went to trembling and praying and spitting all over myself and everything else. And I laid there a long time. Waiting for no nobody was home. Nobody was coming home this scene. And finally, the front of my brain said, look out again. I remember the whole experience. And I looked and just peeped up over the cover like that. And I looked. And I looked again. The light from the street, the street light, shone through the front room into the middle room to the door, where this illusion of a man standing there turned out to be a hat and a coat on a hanger near the door. <laughs> That's what I saw. At that point, it was an illusion. It was unreal. But for the duration of the time that I was under those covers, that for me was real. The fear was real. The danger was real. You know, I mean, I could have had a heart attack under there. You know? <laughs> but I'm just trying to point out the significance of entertaining and perpetuating one's own fears. All fear is unreal. None of it is valid. You're not to fear God nor the devil. You're not to fear un of the unknown realms or unknown things. You're not to fear anything. And what removes fear is knowledge, wisdom, and love. Knowledge removes it from your mind. Love removes it from your nature. And that's important. If you overcome the fear of pain, nothing in the universe can harm you. That's the promise of the yogi master, in the state of harmlessness. By overcoming the fear of pain. And I was amazed when I read uh, Kwame Nkrumah's little book. And his first statement on the very first page, whoever overcomes the fear of pain 
overcomes death. A political spokesman, an African, really amazing. And, and can be proven within oneself that that is true. Some things we need to prove to ourselves. That's what the statement is about. Prove me here with, saith the Lord, and I shall open you a window to heaven and pour you out a blessing that you cannot, that there shall not be room enough to contain you. You have to prove that your God is within you. Waking up your God within you. A, by getting the faculties of your spiritual nature open. Okay, it's 7.30 here. Let me just brisk through the rest of us. We're going to touch on these again, even through the uh, 12 signs of the zodiac. But I think we got the picture of it, even though the third of the uh, sixth seal offers a little bit more information. Revelations chapter 6, verse 12. And I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was great a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. The great earthquake is the quickening in your spiritual body, the shaking of the spirit. What one astrologer said, of course it can only be held as an opinion, that the rationale of earthquakes on the planet is to awaken the people on the planet. Not to danger, but to the need for power. Is what danger represents. When a bully runs up into a little boy's face and says, give me your candy, it should tell the little boy he is not big enough to defend himself. He's not strong enough to defend himself. He's not wise enough to defend himself. But that doesn't happen if he doesn't have self-knowledge. And children should have self-knowledge. The quickening of the spirit is the symbolical representation of the earthquake. There is a point in your spirituality where a dense woven fabric comes over your consciousness is like the sun turning black. It, it, that is, if you have the light on. It, 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 as most of us close our eyes, it's already black. But that's a fabric in your consciousness that will be lifted as you are raised 